Welcome to another great episode here at Lockdown Tactics. We've um, we've been into the official market, um, and it doesn't get any better than this. We've um, we've pulled out the stops. Um, he's wanted to come on the show for you know a number of weeks. He's seen what we're doing, and I've I've really got a great feeling about this uh, interview. And uh, we've 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 really pulled the stops out here at Lockdown Tactics to 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 get him on, boy. The, um, we've got uh, no no other than uh, the elite level referee official East End boy as well by the East End of Glasgow. What do you call him? Well, I'm looking forward to it, Stoddy, because I think I've got I've got the feeling that this could be one of our most powerful emotional um, podcasts that we'll do, and I, and I, and I'm I'm really really looking forward to to hear Wally's to hear Wally's story. Um, one of the top referees, and um, not just only in Scotland but in the world, referee that um, a lot of Top, top games. So, welcome, Wally Collum. Right, Wally, let's cut to it. Why did you want to become a referee? That's a question everybody always asks me, Boydie. And I suppose um, there are a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, I wanted to be a footballer all my life. Um, when I was young, growing up, I wanted to be a goalkeeper. And eventually, the goalie in the primary school team did get an injury and, and I was selected to play. This is a true story. Um, and we get beat 17 now. Um, and I was worried about going into school on the Monday and never really recovered for that. So I decided um, playing in goals wasn't for me. But interestingly, it all came about when, it, when I was 14. Um, I did want to be a footballer. You know, I loved playing football out in the street. Grew up in East End of Glasgow. Um, football was my life, really. Um, but I remember my mother coming into the living room one morning um, with one of the Sunday newspapers and saying... Um, here's an advert for refereeing, something that I'd never thought about. You know, I wouldn't have been interested in refereeing. A lot of referees, people have got relatives in the family of that, and that's what gets them into it. Um, and for me, I looked at that advert um, and I thought, I'm going to get a go. I thought I knew everything about football. I thought I'd know everything about the rules. It'd be dead easy. Um, and then I, I, I went to the classes for 12 weeks. Um, my mother used to jump me up in the bus every Monday night up to Strathclyde Uni. She would go away, wash the dishes, come back up and collect me um, and bring me down the road. Um, and it all took off by there. Never for a minute did I dream that I would be involved at a high level of football. I think the majority of people that go into refereeing think they're going into it because they love football. They want to stay involved. They want to keep involved in it some way. And for me, that's how it started. Um, but never in my wildest dreams at 14 did I think that I would reach the levels that I've reached, you know, and be in some of the stadiums I've been in, be on the pitch with with players like yourselves and that. Um, so, great, it's great. It's been great for me and I've never looked back since that day um, that I took it up. Took okay. a bit of a bit of, I think a few of the folk at school were surprised, you know, um, in East End that somebody would want to take up refereeing, but there we go. To be fair, I wish somebody else would have took up refereeing for the East End as well, but he decided to get in the football route, but um, we'll come back to that in a minute. But, you know, well, considering the abuse that you get, you guys get every week, what, what keeps you going week in, week out? I think it's a love of the game, you know. I mean, I love refereeing. Um, as I'm getting older, I'm 41 now, I suppose retirement beckons for me um, in terms of refereeing in, in four or five years. Um, but I love it. I don't care what match I'm appointed to, what game I'm involved in. I just love it every week. I look forward to it. It keeps me going during the week as well. It brings loads of benefits in the training and that. And I suppose the negativity and the abuse that you get is only a small part of it, you know, and, and, and the big thing for me is about a love of the game and being involved in, in, in what you love. But, as you know, we, we talk about the negativity and we talk about the, the difficulty that brings, but the positives far outweigh the negatives, you know. To be running about a pitch on a Saturday, to be involved in the game at the top level, it's great. But even when I was refereeing at youth level or amateur level, it's like everybody that's involved in sport, it's something to keep you going. It motivates you in life, motivates you to keep fit, gives you an alternative to your work and your family life as well. So it's been really good for me. Well, when you say that about, um, say, Chris, then about, you know, when you're getting, you know, dogs abuse or you're getting, getting hard time, who, who do you turn to for comfort? Sorry, that's a brilliant question because in refereeing it can be difficult. I, I was thinking about when, you know, I was going to be coming on and we were going to be chatting that, who, who does the referee turn to for support? You know, it can be a, a lonely game at times, particularly guys that operate at grassroots level. It can be really lonely, but even at the top level, it can be lonely. If you imagine as a player, the, the two of you maybe have a bad game on a Saturday, um, 
you're back. It's never happened, your, by the way. No, that never happens. No, never to players, never ever. You go back to your, your work on the Monday, you go back into training on the Monday, and you've got a support network run about you. Um, and refereeing is different. Of course, we have colleagues in refereeing that we, we rely on, that we turn to people that we even have coaches in refereeing that support us. But often it can be it can be your wife on a Saturday night that you come in and talk to. My wife doesn't know much about football, and if she looks at a decision and says that it's right, that usually makes um, confirms for me that it's definitely been a mistake. Um, but there's no great network available, um, you know, for referees. And sometimes it can be a lonely business. And there's some really difficult days ahead if you've made if a bad decision on a Saturday or you've got a really difficult game and you're trying to recover for that. But there is your colleagues that you can turn to in support. And everybody, everybody's been through it. I think that's something that's important to stress that among refereeing, there's no anybody there that's exempt for bad decisions or has had bad days at the office. So we know there's people we can turn to and support each other. But it can be really, really difficult. And I would imagine as a referee, it's a much lonelier life than a football player, definitely. Have you ever, obviously you, you say that he had some challenging times. Well, have you ever thought about quitting? Lots of times. Um, sometimes for the for the pressure that maybe my wife would say to me, maybe it's time to finish up, you know, and know in a joking sense that maybe the media stress has been too much or, or there's been periods in my career without a doubt. I'm, I'm sure we'll get the chance to talk about them here and explore where, um, you know, you feel as if you're up against it. You can't get out the newspaper. Um, and I'm wondering off the point a wee bit here, but, you know, I never come into refereeing to be in the media spotlight. Um, I don't have any interest in, in drawing attention to myself. People will say, yeah, that just goes with the territory. And of course, you need to accept that. I don't think referees should have a profile with some kind of celebrity status or always talked about. I think, you know, that's up to the players and the managers. They're the entertainers. The referees are there to do a job and hopefully we contribute to that. Um, but back to the point, of course, there's times I've thought about quitting. Um, you know, every referee will tell you in the early days, particularly on the lower levels of football, you'll come in and throw your bag in the door and say, I've had enough, I won't be going back next week. But you pick yourself up and you go on with it. And it's the same at the very top level. Um, sometimes as well you think maybe maybe I'm just no cut out for this and it's taken you all these years to decide that but you think is there any light at the end of the tunnel here and I've had some difficult times in my life you know and you worry you worry the the negative effect it has on you in terms of your well-being but also the well-being of your family you know and, and, does, it and family? Family? Does, it your, does it affect does it affect your family do, do do you feel as if you know when you when you said there about you know, you have thought about it, and, and is that because like a family deciding, and you're seeing what they're kind of going through? Because when when they're um, they're going through it with you, obviously when you take the criticism, they're taking it with you. You know, sometimes snowy on a Saturday night. You know, I remember Howard Webb writing in his book that his wife used to know the, the way he opened the door if it was going to be um, a relaxing night in the house or one that was um, built up tension. And yep, yep. that's the thing for me. When you come back up the road on a Saturday, things have either gone well or they've not gone well. Um, sometimes it can be the waiting game for four or five hours to find a clip on Y Scout to prove whether you're right or not. And that yep. can be a long Saturday night. Other nights you come back in for games, you know there's nothing to fear what you're going to see in the media. You don't need to be hiding behind the couch. and You can actually sit and relax your family and, and actually enjoy being forced into watching some of the Saturday night TV. But when you talk about like, because when you look at or when you list a lot of referees, you obviously they've they've grew up supporting uh, clubs, they've grew up liking football, and you know they want to be part of everything. Like so, you're no different from any other human being that when you know when the results are coming on a Saturday, you're watching them, you listen to everything on the radio, reading the newspaper. But how difficult is it when you hear the likes of ourselves pundits having a go at the likes of it when a team has lost a game and it's always getting blamed on the referee and stuff like that? You know, because you want to listen to the reports, you want to listen to what's going on because you like football like everybody else. I, I mean, times, boy, day that we would try to say we, we avoid the media or we avoid reading things or avoid looking at things, but the reality is we're all human beings and everybody really has an interest in what other people are saying about them. And sometimes um, you do hide behind the couch looking at that Y Scout clip or whatever, you're worried about what that decision is going to show. Um, in terms of if I was to go back and touch a wee bit on about my family, I, I could cite some examples. Um, you know, like I remember, um, not the Christmas there, but the Christmas before, 
I had a, a day off work, a holiday to, to use up, and um, myself and my wife went to um, Glasgow to, to go some Christmas shopping to buy some stuff for the kids. And within 10 metres of getting out of the car and, and walking towards a shopping centre, three or four guys gave me the, the, the most ridiculous abuse. Um, it frightened my wife. Um, she was really upset. And that trip ended in five minutes. I was back in the motor and I was up the road. Um, so that's the things that affect my family. My family also... Um, See, to, well, well, sorry for jumping in here. What, what does society need to do more? You know, like you, you're going shopping. You're like a normal human being. You've, you've got everybody else. You go and do your job on a Saturday. If that was a player and they had a bad game on a Saturday, they would be getting cuddles. Oh, come on, can I get a picture with you? But because you're, it's not your fault that their team got beat, but you're the one that's getting dogs abused for it. And I suppose people are frustrated because we make mistakes, you know. Um, but you, you, I hear the phrase used in the media a lot, and a lot of the managers, a lot of the players, lots of the pundits use it, that, you know, we know referees will make mistakes. But sometimes that seems hollow words to me, you know, that, that people are wanting to say that, 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 that they're happy to say that. But then when the mistakes happen, there's not really much forgiveness run about the mistakes, you know. that they. And we also have a problem, I think, in society that, Somehow people think we make mistakes deliberately. You know, there's nothing worse for me than coming in on a Saturday night and knowing I've made a mistake. I want to be able to go on with my life for the next five, six, seven days, knowing that the game's gone well and nobody's going to be talking about me. So anybody that might think in society that we're out in some way to cheat or deceive a team, they're kidding themselves on, you know. We don't work hard all week, train hard all week, make the sacrifices we do to then go out and try and make a decision that goes against somebody and think that it's a deliberate decision. We all make mistakes in life, but too often I hear people saying that phrase, and as I say, then they, they go in the bandwagon and jump in that and say, well, we're not accepting that you've made that mistake, it's unacceptable, or really it goes to a height in the media or a stage in the media where it is, is blown out of proportion. I understand that in this lockdown... I've been watching this documentary about Sunderland and, and I can start to see it from a perspective, you know, in terms of the pressure chief executives are under. I've known the pressure managers and players are under, but we're also under pressure and, and we're trying our very best to make sure that we don't make the mistakes. But mistakes will happen. And I go back to, to an example that, that we've brought in technology a, a, a refereeing. We've brought in technology to football. That tells you even at the highest level of the game, with the, the best people in the game, the best referees if you take a World Cup, but yet we're relying on VAR because we know mistakes will happen and we need something there to protect us, something there um, that, will, that will help us get the decisions right. What, well, what more can be I don't, What more can be done to... I don't feel... Do you feel threatened when you're out and about? What more can be done to threat, to, 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 um, to safeguard the referees? I think there needs to be an acceptance that we're ordinary people, um, we're ordinary families, you know, and, and we want to just go about our business. Um, it worries me when I see, you know, in recent times about referees receiving threats. Um, it's very difficult for, for people like me to go places where you're not recognised, you know. And, and I accept that it goes with the territory that people at times... But it doesn't make it right, though. It doesn't make it, it doesn't right. make it right. It doesn't make it right. Um, and some of the abuse you're subjected to in stadiums, it's not right. You know, it's part of the course to, to, to accept that people will shout things at you, you know, people will disagree with decisions. But when it becomes personal, I think that's a worry, you know. And, and I don't think it should be that just because somebody's in a football stadium, and the two of you will know this as well as me, that it means they've got the right to shout anything at you, you know. And I think we need to respect people in, in, in the public spotlight, whether they're referees, whether they're players, that we've got families, you know. I also need to hold down a full-time job, you know. Um, so so we've got other commitments, and it shouldn't be about the, the negativity that surrounds people at times and about that difficulty that you sometimes find yourself in um, when something's not going that well, that then you're you're pushed really into that spotlight and you can't really get out of it. And that affects your confidence. Um, you know, if a referee doesn't perform well on a Saturday, contrary to what people think, we receive a bad mark, a bad report. Um, and that, of course, influences the appointments you get and, of course, influences your confidence because I believe refereeing is a bit of confidence game. If you're refereeing well and things are going well for you, you get into each game the confidence you're, you're probably about to make the right decision. It's like a striker, it's in form. It's the same thing. Whereas if you're going through a bad spell, and it happens to referees, it's happened to me often, 
Um, you worry about your next game. You don't look forward to it as much for the right reasons. You worry what is about your, what is your th- what's your thoughts in the build up to that game then? If you, if you're worrying about it, your thoughts are just get through it. It's ninety minutes. You need to get through it with as little attention drawn in you as possible, um, and you need to try and get everything right. There's no any acceptance there that you can make another mistake. If you've made a bad mistake the week before, then it's a snowball effect. Let me give you an example in that boy. Day. In 2000, late 2015, I was appointed in the December to go to Euro 2016, represent Scotland, probably the highlight of my career. But as soon as that appointment was made, I remember refereeing at Falkirk Rangers on a Saturday in a live TV game, and it was no a good performance. Um, there was a, a wrong penalty awarded for a handball. There was also a penalty awarded incorrectly when the foul was outside the box. And I knew beyond that, that that people would, you know, slaughter me in the media because they would say, here he's been selected for the Euro and look at this performance. And there was a snowball effect there because I went on a run of probably about three or four games where things never went well at all in that period. It was a really difficult period because I found myself that the SFA made a decision to um, bring me out of the Premier League, bring me out of the spotlight for probably a four-week spell. Um, there was an online petition. I, I, I must admit, I try my best to avoid social media, but you can imagine when somebody puts an online petition about you, um, you sure as anything find out about that. I think there was thousands of people signing it that I should never referee again. Um, and there was people that I probably thought had gone quite well with. Um, an example of that would be the former Commander and Hearts manager, Jim Jeffries. Um, Jim had always been really good with me um, as a young referee, always took a lot of time to speak to me. And during this time where I was getting battered for pillar to post, um, he came out and wrote an article and said, you know, I was never a good enough referee. And that really hurt me because there was somebody I thought perhaps had did a lot of time for me. And even when he wasn't managing, when he gave up in the managing, he would come into the dressing room at games, he was there as a spectator and he'd come in and talk to me. And I remember that torrid time of three or four months worrying for one game to the next. Um, and that affected my well-being, affected my family's well-being every single day, every single night. That's all I wanted to talk about. I wasn't interested in watching the TV. I was talking to my wife, what should I do next? Should I come out and speak in the media? Should I show people how much this is affecting me? And I remember when I got on that plane to go to Euro 2016, I was really proud. I was looking forward to representing Scotland. But my underlying thought was, don't make a mess of this. Don't come back and embarrass yourself, you know. And I was determined to go there and perform well for Scotland, but for myself, for the guys that went there with me, that supported me. Um, You know, two guys that came in that trip with me to Euro 2016 gave up their jobs to come. John Beaton and Bobby Madden came behind the goal with me. Um, Their employers wouldn't allow them to go for that length of time, so they gave up their job. So the pressure that was lying in me there to perform, and we did perform, we, we did really well in two games, Lo and behold, unusually, um, England, Northern Ireland and Wales went through to the next round. Clattenburg and Atkinson, two English referees who were much more experienced than me, um, were retained. We were only retained, no for any negative reason. But I come back with, with, you know, intact, I felt. But I remember flying back for the Euro as well, thinking, what will the media say about me? Will they say I came here and only did two games on the back of what had been probably a poor season for me? And listen, that doesn't mean that I felt that my performance was in any way acceptable. But um, in that season, I was probably really, really struggling. And it made me more determined to succeed. You know, I was talking about resilience and that and the real importance of trying to get through things. But that was a low point for me. Back well, to, Sno- back to Snoddy's point there about that, sorry. That was a time where I was very close to, to getting up. And my wife wanted me to finish in. My wife wanted me to finish. Euro was doubly difficult for me because... That, I talked to you about that period, and I don't want to focus on a negative here, but maybe it's a good point to put across about that well-being. For that period, for the December to the Euro um, in 2016, um, I thought a lot of my mother, who had brought that advert in, I told you about at the start, um, who would encouraged me to referee. And for three years previous to 2016, probably for about 2012, 2013 onwards, my mother started to take really unwell. And we couldn't get to the boat and what was wrong with her. Probably we lived in denial for a long period of time. But my mother took that terrible illness, Alzheimer's. And I thought when you talked about things like illnesses like that, I was ignorant to it. I thought it was about some old woman or man who maybe forgot their keys or forgot to switch off the cooker. 
And my mother took very ill that she lost being able to speak. She didn't know who I was. She eventually died late in 2016. But it was a sore point for me when I went to the Euro because she didn't see me. Um, and that was a hard thing for me, that, that she had put so much into that refereeing and helped me all through my life, encouraged me. And yet, when I walked out in Marseille, I knew that she'd be looking at a screen with my dad next to her in a home, but she didn't know who I was. And, and that was a sore point. So for one of my highlights in my career, and I don't want to paint that really negative picture, and I hope you don't mind me being quite emotional about it, but it was also one of the lowlights in my career because she didn't see me there, and that would have meant so much to me for her. Um, and my father, who I lost recently as well, I feel as if they probably missed it in seeing, seeing me, and yet they gave me so much and, and gave me as good an upbringing as they could. They never had much in their life. But all they instilled in me was to, to be hard working and be grateful for what you've got. See on that, well, like see the likes of, I mean, and that's something else we, we should we should pick up here as well. Like, see if something happens to, um, you know, like if, if something happens to a player's mother or father if they pass away, and like it's it's well documented, or they might be going through stuff and that. But you know, as a referee, I mean, I couldn't have told you that, but you're then asked to go and referee on a Saturday. How difficult is that? That was really difficult, boy. I remember, you know, um, driving back for a game at Aloha and, and, and my dad phoning me and telling me to come come straight to, to, to the house because he needed a bit of respite. You know, my mother was in a really difficult way then and, and my dad was playing the lone man at looking after her and, and trying his best and did a great job with it before we had to put on the home. But people might criticise me for saying that because they might say, well, if, if you were going through a bad spell, maybe you should have stepped out of the referee because it all coincides with that difficult time, 2015, 2016. But, you know, sometimes the referee was a get-out for me, you know, to go and referee a game or go and train in the morning or put all my attention on refereeing. was taking my, taking my mind away from a situation that was becoming worse on a day-to-day -day basis, you know. And, and people that have lived with people with these illnesses will know exactly what I mean, you know. And, and then I remember... I'll tell you a true story, boy, that I'm probably ashamed of, to tell, but I'm going to tell it and I'm going to be quite open about it. I refereed St Murn and Dundee United in the Scottish Cup um, in January 2019, January, January or Feb, February 2019, and I missed a, a clear red card defence. Um, one of the McGinn brothers um, struck um, the boy Cammy Smith for Dundee United in the face, and I was caught directly behind it gave a yellow card, hazarded a guess that it was a reckless challenge. When you look back in it, it was a red card challenge. As I was driving back to, to where I live, for, for Paisley, my dad phoned me to tell me that, um, to come to, to his house. Um, he lived in his own, um, to come. And my dad was very, very unwell that night. I arrived at the house. I took him to, we phoned an ambulance, took him to hospital. He never came out of the hospital. But you know that night, when my dad was sitting in the hospital and, and we were getting all the, 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 the results back and, and the word was coming back that he, was, he wasn't going to come out of the, the hospital. In fact, he died within five or six days. Do you know, I was searching in between here and about all these tests he was getting um, on my phone to find a clip of that challenge at St Murn Dundee United because I was so worried about it was going to be rang and what would, what would they be saying about me that night? What would they be saying about me the next day? And I think I took a reality check at the end of that. And I had a lot of soul searching that week in the hospital when my dad was lying there. And I thought to myself, football is important and it is important. And at times it can be really important. And for people, it can be about life and death. But there was something that didn't rest easy with me. And I hope that makes sense, what I'm saying. And I thought, mm -hmm. you, need to put things, you need to put things in perspective here. I was worrying about a decision on a Saturday night in a hospital when I was going to listen to somebody telling me that, that my dad's time was up. Yeah, but I think, Wally, as well, though, I mean, and, and sorry to hear about your dad, but what, what, what I mean by that is that that is the pressure that you are under, and it's it's wrong. It is wrong that that's what you are worrying about. Aye, and, and we have to worry about it. We have to worry about the decisions being right or wrong. And there is always scope for you to say, I want to step out the limelight, you know, uh, there's no any, you're never forced to do games, but... I'm sure the two of you can understand, and everybody in every walk of life that's... Oh, well, I know exactly where you're coming from, because the exact same thing happened with me, because I went straight on the pitch with my little brother that Saturday and played at Dundee, and people were saying, how could you How could you, How could could you? you do it? How could you get through? Because it was my escape. 
I agree. It was my it was my yeah. escape to get out. It was my escape to get out there, go and play football, go and train, well, go and train, then go and play football. That was my escape. I know exactly where you're coming from. And I took no time away from it, you know, um, at the two situations, my parents. It was it was it was a horrible time, you know, in the two situations. But but that's life. But um, people that know me know I'm a private person, you know, and and and, and I don't often talk about these kind of things, no, because of anything to hide. I 100% agree with you, Boydie. Some people would be very critical of us, but when you think of your situation, you think of my situation, sometimes it's an escape. You know, for that period of time, I could focus. It'd have been, you know, if I had um, decided that I wanted to come out the refereeing for a period of time, I wanted to stop training, I don't know where that would have led. I don't know. Well, I see, see how you speak about, you know, there might be a perception of you or, you know, people think you did it at the start of the interview about people, you know, miserable or uh, people might judge you or whatever in certain situations. But this is why I says that I think we do really need to see a lot more referees and, and see them speaking and, and hear them speaking so open and honest like this because it would change a lot of people's perception and mindset and see the sacrifices and the mental toughness it is to be at the level you're at and to be at the elite level? I think you're right, Snoddy. I think I think folk just see us in this robotic way. You know, they see Wally Collum, the referee. They probably don't see you a lot of times as a human being with, with, with the same emotions, the same feelings that, that everybody else has got, you know, and, and the same life challenges, you know. that and, and just because I've taken up refereeing or because I'm involved at that high level of refereeing, doesn't mean I don't have the feelings or the experiences. The same as you guys as players, you've got the same feelings. And sometimes people think as well that we're superhuman, you know, that things don't get to us or that, that we're, we, we don't have these difficulties. But I'm grateful for, for any of the difficulties I've, uh, I've experienced in my life. I'm still grateful for, for the involvement I've had in refereeing because it's kept me going. Um, I, I've said quite openly, I think that in terms of when I was really young, I think refereeing gave me a good idea about trying to get a focus in life and, and, and focus my life in general and, and try and make something in my life. And again, I'm, I'm grateful for that and grateful for that opportunity, but also remember the people that perhaps didn't get the same opportunities at me. It's not your point, though, about sometimes when we go to Europe, we're out of that Scottish environment, you know, and you're still in the big goldfish bowl but you've probably got a release. You go to a game, you perform in a game where people don't really know you, um, and then you're back away for that as well. Um, but I can talk about another low point, you know, domestically this season. I thought I did a really good season. Um, it probably ended at the wrong time for me. I felt it was in a good run of performances. But I go back to October, um, where I refereed them um, in a Europa League game in, in, in Rome. Um, I'd been in a good run in, in Europe, and I refereed Roma, Borussia Mönchengladbach. Um the game had gone great. I was really, really feeling great. In comes a bone to the box in injury time. To me, it looked clear it had hit Chris Smalling's arm and I awarded a penalty um, and it hit his face. It was proved it hit his face. If only a dva or only a rewind button. Um, and again, you're not back. You know, you, you take a huge tumble in your confidence. It was a Thursday night. I didn't sleep a wink. Um, again, I spoke on the phone. That was a massive... That was a massive talking point, Willie. Really, that, that was that was that was global. Obviously, social media. I remember. I actually remember that fully. But to get in depth, how how were you feeling after that? Firstly, you're apologetic to the player, to the club. I spoke to the, the Roma people at the end of the match because you know quite instantly. And um, by the time you come off that pitch, um, as you imagine, in an age of technology, we see clips immediately. So I was devastated. Um, devastated. Suddenly within a split second, you see your career flashing in front of you because you think, is this such a high-profile error? I'll never recover for this, you know, because it's been made at the very highest level of the game. Never slept a wink, phoned my wife umpteen times in the middle of the night, where do we go for here? She's probably thinking on the other end of the phone, here we go again. You come back on the Friday, you're no worth a button, you're, you're about to referee a Premier League game on a Saturday at Kilmarnock and St Mum, and then... Um, You've got to go out there and perform. And you, sometimes it's the best thing for a referee, um, and I'm sure it is for players as well, to get back in that saddle, back and try and make decisions. But again, you get through that spell of 
I can't afford to make a mistake here. There's also the embarrassing factor. You know, what, what are people in the stadium thinking? What are the media writing about you? You don't want to read the media because you've got another game to prepare, but what are they writing about you in the space of 24 hours when you've made what many people would perceive a ridiculous decision, you know? And all the emotions are running through your mind. Again, it goes through your mind. Am, am I no good enough for this? Is it time to go? You know, Is it is there a process there? Well, no disrespect, right? But if, if if I don't, if I make a decision where it's a, you know, it's a big factor in a game, which that was, as, as was obviously spoke about, if Boyd misses a couple of vital chances and you say, right, you need to, you need to sit out for a while, it's your, your confidence doesn't quite there. You know, you say that, is there, is, is there a process, you know, when it's, you know, you have went across and it's, it's you know, different surroundings, I get that, but does you need to come up in front of you know, um, like a boss, a panel, is what, what happens with the process, or is it just go back to Scotland, go back in, and then come back stronger? Ah, so, so, I mean, the, well, every game you referee, whether it's abroad or domestically, there's, a, there's an observer in the stand, um, and there's a written report, there's a mark. Um, obviously, you make a decision like that, it's an adverse mark. Um, I would pretty much guarantee that I lost it in two further European games that I would have been scheduled to referee. Because yep. your performance not up to scratch, you know, and 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 that's right. Because how do you make a decision like that? It's a bad decision. Of course, everybody makes mistakes, but you can't just jump into the next top match and expect everybody to forget about that. That's not really any good for the referee either. It's sometimes better to be brought out the, the limelight. But there's support here, you know. I mean, the head. But well, I, well, I see on that. See on that. You're saying you're saying that it's a good thing to come out, but the majority of yeah, I would say the majority of of the media is such in Scotland. If you're took out a game, it's highlighted as or you're missing out this game because we're rubbish the last one. It's not a case of you've been took out the game to actually, you know, maybe calm down, learn, get your own self, get your thoughts back together. It's it's about they're rubbing it in that you're missing a game. Sometimes, boy, do the media the media don't get it right here in Scotland about referees missing a game. You know. If you make a really high-profile error that I did in Rome, there needs to be consequences for a decision like that. You make a mistake, you award a penalty that's no right, and it's a really close decision. Is there contact? Is there no? Snoddy might say it's a penalty. You boy, they might say it's no. They're no decisions you're going to punish referees for. You know, people might think, oh, well, if it's their team it's, it's affected by that, then the referee should be punished. Players, referees will make mistakes every game. It's about the magnitude of that. And the media might say, you know, Willie Collins made an error in this game or perceived to make an error in a Scottish game. And then the next week he finds he's selling the championship. But what people need to remember, we don't, we only have a, a Premier League with 12 teams. You can't referee in the Premier League every week. So we are scheduled at times to be a fourth official or scheduled at times to referee in the lower leagues. And then there'll be other times where, we're, where we need to be removed for perhaps a Premier League fixture we're appointed to because it's best for the referee to recover. The referee maybe doesn't want to be in the spotlight. You make a really high-profile error and then you, you go back into a, a top live TV match the following week, you're under intense pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, you're no, you're no the referee that you would be if you'd refereed out your skin the previous week and get three big decisions right and you're refereeing with confidence. Well, like players, I suppose... Well, see, 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 well, see, do you feel as if... I mean, I know we was touched on the media side there a little bit, but do you feel as if, and listen, I've been guilty, I'm sure Snoddy's been guilty of as well, do you feel as if players, you know, but when you're in a referee's face swearing and shouting when they make a decision, or, you know, as you say, some are right, some are wrong, but you're in their face having a go at them, that then transfers into the stadium, into the ground, the fans think, or the players speak like that to the referees, we can speak like that. Do you feel as if managers, players, coaches, whatever, there's, there's a lot, there's, or there should be a... Uh, a responsibility on them to behave or act differently um, around referees during a match. Players and managers have got a responsibility as well to support referees in the job we've got, you know, and be a bit more understanding. See, when you see that, Willie, in terms of supporting referees, well, I've, I've, there's, there's been loads of incidents, and, and you know, usually it's us as pundits, we're asked to, to comment on these. What's your thoughts on players actually going out there to cheat, dive? You make a decision. They have been the ones who have dived, and you might get it right, you might get it wrong, but you are the person who has got to take or shoulder the responsibility, take the brunt of it. But they are blatantly cheating, blatantly. So I mean, it's difficult because referees are expected to get it right, whether players are cheating or not. 
a bugbear of mine has always been that, that if a player dives and, and the referee incorrectly awards a penalty, say, um, it'll be my name in the back page of the media. Um, it'll, be my, it'll be me that will be, be, be being discussed in the, the studio at the end of the game. I, it's, I would often love if um, the TV companies or the media would say to a player that dived, could you come out in front of the camera here or could you come out to the written press? We'll show you the clip what happened and could you tell us you know why did this happen why did you decide that was the right decision so a referee is only as good as how the players make him you know if players are behaving well and and you know are being honest and um, showing integrity to each other it makes your job much easier and um, if players are, are diving and players are trying to gain every advantage out with the laws of the game it can make it very very difficult sometimes as games boy i'll be honest where even if the referee gets all the decisions right, it can be difficult to look good as a referee in that game. You know, sometimes it can be, there's so much controversy in a game, even if at the end of the day you can look back and say the referee was right in the decisions he made, it's really difficult to have, to have refereed that game well or look as if you've refereed it well because so much has happened. People will say the best referees are the referees that go unnoticed. I don't buy into that, you know. There's loads of games I can referee and I go unnoticed because nothing happens, but... Good referees still need to get noticed because if there's three and four big decisions in a game and you're a good referee and you get the three or four of them right, if no gone unnoticed, you've got the decisions right. And ultimately, that's whatever that's the only thing referees are judged on is about getting big decisions right.